energy is one of the most contentious issues in Alberta. Climate change is upon us, but we still need revenue from oil and gas to pay for the transition to renewables. We must certainly do our share in helping preserve the planet, but in harvesting wind power in southwest Alberta, are we putting a unique ecosystem at risk? Is there a danger of destroying the bio biodiversity of the plains? So are environmentally sensitive areas of southwestern Alberta being sacrificed for wind power? That is the question that will be addressed by today's speaker, Bobby Lambright. Ms. Lambright worked for the ATCO group of companies more than 30 years in a variety of the, of the group's companies and in a variety of roles. These included president of ATCO's electric distribution company in Alberta, as well as its, as its electricity operations in the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. Most recently, she served as ATCO's managing director for Australia. Retired just over a year ago, Bobby Lambride is acti actively involved with the Livingstone Landowners Group. She has conducted considerable research into Alberta Renewable Energy Program and the status of wind generation and associated transmission development, particularly as they relate to southwestern Alberta and the MD of Pincher Creek. Please welcome Bobby Lambright. Thanks, Trevor. Okay, I'm going to try and keep this microphone in front of me, and it might be a bit of a challenge because I'm a bit of a mover, but I, I'm going to do my best. So first of all, thanks to everyone for coming out today. Obviously, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart and to the members of the Livingston Landowners Group. And just to let you know who the Livingston Landowners Group is, we're a group of ranchers and landowners who are predominantly based in the Livingston and Porcupine Hills area of the MD of Pincher Creek. And you might think I'm a little far afield when I come here to speak about this issue to all of you. But when I talk about southwestern Alberta, I'm using the definition that the Alberta Electric System Operator uses, which basically means it's the entire uh, southern part of Alberta up to east of Lethbridge. And then if you go further east and north, it becomes um, central east. But the, the issue, I think, affects all of us in Alberta and beyond. So let me um, talk a little bit about what I'm concerned about and what I'm going to share with you today. So first and, and foremost, most of the time when people talk about renewals, renewables, they are talking about it as a solution to climate change. And certainly there is a need for renewables in the energy mix. And there needs to be more research and more development of how that can be a viable energy source. However, where you locate these things um, has a tremendous impact on the environmental benefit that you may get um, or not get from having the renewables. The other thing I want to talk a bit about is the cumulative impact. You know, sometimes we look at these things as if they're one-offs. It's when you put everything together that you get a view of what's just the overall impact and what should we do about it. And the, the final key point is really around the unique ecosystems that we're talking about across southern Alberta. And I know that this group has had a number of presentations from groups such as the Nature Conservancy and others who've talked about the importance of native grasslands. And I'm going to touch on that um, as well as we move through the presentation. Whoops. Where are we going here? So let me talk a bit about the, um, the state in Alberta today. So what's actually happened with renewables? So over the last 10, 15 years, there's about 1,480 megawatts of installed wind development in the province. So this is wind development that's occurred um, on a market basis. Oops. 
uh, on a market basis. So we have um, most of that wind has actually occurred in the MD of Pincher Creek. In fact, all but 350 megawatts is based in the MD that I'm from. Since then, the um, previous government introduced a renewables electricity program with the goal of introducing another 5,000 megawatts of renewable energy. And the intent of that was as a step towards um, positively impacting the energy mix in a way that would help us address climate change. So I think the intent was very positive. Um, the outcome, I have some concerns about. But having said that, the result of those initial programs, which were announced last December, is that there are now a number of new wind developments, almost doubling what we have in the province, that are waiting to go ahead. These are all wind developments that are proceeding because they had the opportunity to get in on the 20-year guaranteed price um, contracts that were offered by the government. So those have all been approved by the previous government. Now, presumably, they'll go through the approval process with the Alberta Utilities Commission. What happens beyond that is a bit uncertain. I mean, I think we've all heard the, the different political comments, but at the moment, there hasn't been a formal change to the program, but it may be slower than what it was previously anticipated. The other thing that is an outcome of all of this new development is that there are multiple new transmission programs that have been identified as being necessary. So these transmission projects um, are going to be largely, again, in the southern part of the province, although there are a couple that have been identified for central east. So why, why is this a problem? Well, let's look at the two conflicts that we're trying to address here. So the first one is that we are rich in uh, wind resources. Any of us who live in the area know this well. You know, we're one of the, Lethbridge is one of the windiest cities. Certainly out where we live near Pincher Creek, it's not uncommon for us to get winds in the order of 180 or even 200 kilometers an hour. Um, so the wind force is quite strong. That can occasionally be a challenge for wind developers, but as a general rule, I would say our strong wind resources have, a, have attracted a lot of wind development interest. And certainly the, the kind of open for business policy that's been here to attract uh, wind development hasn't hurt either. The conflict is that this same area where a lot of the wind resources exist is also one of the last remaining segments of large tracts of undeveloped native grassland. And that native grassland is absolutely critical to preserving our wetlands, our water, our biodiversity of the wildlife species that we have in this province. And the third point, and I think it's a really critical one when you're looking at the pros and cons of more wind energy and the impact on native prairie, is how important native prairie is as a carbon sink. I mean, and, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. So in terms of, of that picture, um, this is a chart. You may have seen it before because it's from the um, Nature Conservancy. And what it shows is what we used to have as the Great Plains, if all of us had lived you know, a few hundred years ago, uh, back in 1867, that pile of green on the left-hand side, is what we used to have um, across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and into Manitoba. If you look at the middle chart, it's a much reduced picture. Almost all of that native grassland has been developed, whether it's agricultural or you know, industrial development, whatever it happens to be, most of it is gone. What you see in the very far slide, and I'm afraid it's a little bit difficult probably to see from the back, but there's a little segment that is marked in red. And that segment, which happens to correspond pretty closely with the eastern slopes of the Livingston Range, is in fact the only remaining area of native grassland that has virtually a full complement of species. So the, the, the wildlife and the birds that would historically have inhabited native grassland are still largely intact in this very tiny area um, of Alberta. 
Whoops, did I miss one? Yeah, so, so this is, a, is another really key um, point. The area that has been targeted in our um, MD for development is some of the most significant remaining native grassland in the province. So we actually, as a Livingston Landowners Group, we engaged a company called ALSEs, whom some of you may know. They are a group of planners and environmentalists out of Calgary who do um, an assessment of the cumulative impact of different types of development. So we had specifically asked them to take a look at the impact of where the windmills were going and where the transmission was going, and this particular view is just of the MD of Pincher Creek. But if you look up at this area, um, this is just the area west of Highway 22, for those of you who are familiar, down to um, around um, Pincher Creek. And that's the area targeted by the Alberta Electric System Operator and AltaLink as being the best place for new transmission. And that transmission is not just to serve the windmills in our area, it's to serve all of the new wind that is coming coming into the southwest. So that additional um, significant amount of wind that I talked about being part of the renewable electricity program, um, ISO has basically said, well, the best way to serve that is first to build more transmission out here in the middle of the native prairie, and secondly, they're looking at some additional transmission up in, in central East. So they, they do need more transmission. They've used up pretty much all that was there with this latest round of the renewable electricity program. So they're pushing hard to go in with more transmission. And it impacts not just the at-risk species, and I'm going to talk more about this too, and I know sometimes people discount the impact on things like viewscapes. But for some of us, that's the, the main reason we live in the areas that we live is because the natural beauty is so extraordinary. It's part of a lifestyle that, that many of us are really committed to in terms of the ranching um, lifestyle. And the viewscapes, if any of you have driven the road from Highway 3 from Pincher to Lethbridge, you've seen the impact of transmission and wind on the viewscape. So although I'm talking predominantly about the environment, I guess I'm acknowledging that there are many other issues that can be associated with this that are of deep concern to people. So this is, is a, um, one of the maps that Alsays did for us. And again, I'm sorry, it's probably not the easiest thing to read. But the main point I want you to see is that what the chart, the areas that are in black on the chart are basically areas that are untouched, unfragmented native prairie. So it hasn't been cultivated and it hasn't been developed. And what has been happening um, in Pincher Creek over the last number of years is if you look at where the wind development is occurring, it's very, very concentrated. And what was most disturbing, I think, to many of us is a lot of it, and now there's a, quite a bit of new proposed in this, is happening on these dark areas. You know, I'll give you an example of one active project. It um, affects 7,000 acres of land for 28 windmills. And it is including about 2,000 acres of native prairie. And people will say to you, oh, well, you know, the, the footprint's really small, so even though it's on native prairie, it's not going to be that significant. It actually is quite significant when you take into account the disruption that actually has to happen to the land and the difficulty with reclamation. I think it's a bit of a different story if you're developing on already disturbed lands, because it's not that hard to replace cropland with cropland after you've built something. It is virtually impossible to replace rough fescue native prairie once it's been disturbed. You can put something else there, but you're not going to recreate um, that grassland. The other thing it doesn't address is cumulative impact. The concentration of this amount of windmills in one area obviously has a much bigger impact on wildlife corridors, you know, the, the viability of wildlife. And, you know, the information that I'm sharing isn't something that, you know, we've just developed or pulled out of, you know, anti-windmill documents. It's mostly from the applications filed by the wind developers themselves because they are required to do an environmental assessment and they 
acknowledge as much as anybody that when you build on native prairie, it has the most significant impact on wildlife, and certainly there are unique um, plants that are also disrupted in that process. So, so there's a few other considerations that have kind of changed literally the landscape when it comes to wind development. Back when wind was first being developed in the Pincher Creek area, the turbines were very noticeable, but relatively small. So if you look over here, this was one of the first turbines put in place in the Pincher Creek area, and it was about 70 meters high. And at that time, most of the windmills were in that order of magnitude, um, around 70, 75 meters high. And what's happening is it's been getting bigger and bigger over time. And the most recent windmill application, so there's three here on the end, the size of the towers is almost three times what it used to be. So if you're looking at something that's 150, 170, 190 meters tall, you are talking about a turbine that is the height of more than a 50-story building. In fact, the, the one project, this, this one here at the end, the towers will be the same height as the Calgary Tower. So just envision that. It's like having you know, 28 Calgary Towers you know, on, on a particular piece of land. So, so the size has a bearing. It impacts the impact, surface impact, and it certainly impacts the visual impact. And in terms of surface impact, this is, this, these are all stats I've pulled from live windmill applications. And what they acknowledge, and it's understandable given what they have to accomplish in terms of installing these facilities, is they basically have to go in and do a lot of topsoil stripping. And again, if you're in an area that is already disturbed and developed, you take that topsoil, you put it to the side, um, you cover it, and you're good. Um, but it's a little different in an area with the kind of wind erosion that we have and the difficulty doing reclamation. There's also huge um, requirements for laydown areas, putting in big um, pads to hold these large cranes, you know, the need for temporary and um, access roads. The other thing that's critical is um, when you have wind, you have a need for transmission. And it doesn't matter um, if it's a standalone project transmission or system transmission, but you typically, if you build a windmill, you have to build a large substation, you have to build the cabling between the different towers, and you have to connect to the system. So you need a lot of transmission around your project, and then you need the system to be able to accommodate your transmission. So getting down to, I guess, kind of the, the close here, what's the, what's the cumulative impact of all of this stuff that I'm talking about? Certainly there are, I think, serious environmental conflict concerns. And it really comes down to where are these projects going to be based, and what about associated infrastructure such as transmission? As I mentioned earlier, you know, we're all a little bit sensitive to the, the viewscape destruction as well. It's not small. I mean, when you look, I don't know, you know, from this area, from certainly our area, it's one of the unique and special characteristics of our land that people really, really value. There's been a lot of studies done in southern Alberta that say, what do people care about? What do they value? They value the land. They value the water. They value the, the unique beauty and the unique diversity of the ecosystems in our area, and those get destroyed. And although I won't dwell on this point, I know I'm getting close to the, um, to the end here, is the um, costs. It's not free and it's not even really cheap. And I say that from the perspective, not that we may not need to sometimes spend more, we may, um, because it's the right thing to do. But having said that, it does, there are costs that go into these decisions. There's the, the cost, like I said, of the loss of carbon storage, and I, I didn't get into that in a lot of detail, but if you think about the um, land under Native Prairie, it can hold something like 200 tons of um, carbon in the soil.
And that, those stats are information I got from various studies that have been put forward by the Prairie Conservation Forum. And there's been a lot of research into this. That carbon is stored in the soil, and it's really important that it stays there. If you dig up that soil, you're releasing more carbon into the air. And it's, it's probably one of the most efficient carbon sinks that we have in some ways even more so than the forests because the carbon is stored in the soil as opposed to being above ground. So there's the cost environmentally, there's a cost in terms of carbon storage, and there's a cost in terms of dollars because it's not cheap to be able to offer people 20-year contracts um, at a guaranteed price. It's not cheap to build all of this transmission that's required, and those are all costs that um, accrue directly to the taxpayer. So where does that leave us? In terms of managing the risk, I think it is absolutely essential that we work together to formally protect the native prairie. There are some great guidelines out there, tremendous numbers of studies that have been completed, a lot of organizations that stand up and talk about how important it is to preserve our native grasslands, but we are losing them to industrial creep, not people making you know, a decision, I wish to destroy native grassland, but just project by project, we're eating away at those large, unfragmented native prairie areas. We need tighter standards for transmission and where it can be placed. It is not subject to even the rules that wind energy is subject to for environmental protections of native prairie. And finally, you know, I think we need to work together to preserve what is a very unique and special environmental legacy. We want it to be here for our generation, for our children, and for our children's children. And that means we have to act now. That's all.